Well, as I stood there on a, on a cold autumn day, I knew I had gotten myself into it. It had started a few weeks earlier. Darren DiGatano and I were, were trading insults back and forth. And he made fun of me being in the show choir in, in middle school. And, and I made fun of him for, for how bad of a football player he was. And we went back and forth and it got a little more heated and a little more heated until I made fun of his mom. And he crossed the line and Darren Nicotano in front of all of our friends called me out and challenged me to a fight. And we were standing there after school on that autumn day, I on one side of this vacant lot, him on the other side of the vacant lot, and seemingly our entire school gathered around watching us. And as I stood there, I resolved to myself that I wasn't going to fight him. It was really me who had stepped over the line. I had made the mistake. I was the one who crossed that, that line. And I was going to apologize. And I was going to be the, the better man. No matter what happened, no matter how many people chanted, no matter if they said that I was chicken or a coward, I wasn't going to fight at all. And as I looked across the field, I had a feeling that Darren was thinking the same thing also. But the cheers were getting louder, the, the, the guys were, were taunting us and, and getting more and more agitated and, and animated and they were getting tired of waiting for something to happen and finally somebody was behind Darren and they shoved him towards me. And I think half out of surprise and, and half out of kind of built up aggression and, and being livened up by the crowd, he hauled off and he whacked me right in the nose. And I paused for a second, and I still remember distinctly thinking, it's okay. We can still talk this out. I'm still going to apologize. I deserve that. It's fine. And I stood there, and I looked down, and I, my nose was, was numb from the hit. And I reached up, and I, I put my hand to my face, and I realized that I was gushing blood from my nose. And I took a deep breath, and I paused, and I... I tried to wait for the Holy Spirit to give me some kind of strength and some kind of resolve. And I paused for another moment, and then I beat the heck out of Darren. <laughs> I regret it. I really do. Darren and I still actually see each other every once in a while. He still lives nearby my hometown. We actually stayed friends um, into high school and, and knew each other for, for all those years. But I apologize and I regret it because I let my emotions get the better. I let my, my anger and I lost myself in that fight. I didn't do what I had planned on doing and I definitely didn't do what was right there. But it, it reminds me of a quote from a, a, a wonderful philosopher, an amazing orator, Mike Tyson, <laughs> who Back in the 80s, when he was that unstoppable force, a sportscaster was, was conducting an interview with him. And they said, Mike, if you were going to fight you, what kind of plan would you have? How would you, how would you approach the fight? How do you think you can be defeated? And really, in a brilliant comment, Mike Tyson paused for a second, and he said, you know, everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face. And it's true. I mean, really, how often when you take that hit do you kind of lose your plan, lose yourself, and just run off of raw emotion? That's exactly what our Gospel and our Old Testament reading are, are both about today. We have the story of Ahaz in the Old Testament, in the Isaiah passage. Now, Ahaz is going to give you a little bit of, of background history here. Ahaz is the, uh, is the king of the southern kingdom of Israel. Israel split into two. It's the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. Southern kingdom is called Judah, and Ahaz is the king there. Now the northern kingdom of Israel and the neighboring kingdom of Syria have both just been conquered by the big, bad Assyrian army. These guys were nasty. They were ruthless, and they were knocking off kingdoms 
left and right as they were conquering the whole known world. They were the bad guy in this story. And they had just, the Assyrian army had just swept in and conquered Syria and the northern kingdom and was poised to come down into Judah and throw Ahaz off of the throne and take over his part of the kingdom. Ahaz is petrified about losing his power, about losing his life in the end, and about sacrificing his entire kingdom. Well, in the story leading up to this, the Syrian army and the northern kingdom army came to Ahaz. And they said, Ahaz, the only way we're going to get out of this is if we come together, if we form a coalition and we fight together. But right after they came to him, Isaiah comes to Ahaz and speaks on behalf of the Lord and says, Ahaz, you don't have to form any kind of coalition. God is the only coalition you need. You just need to trust that God will get you through this. And Ahaz says, okay. And Ahaz holds on there, but it gets worse and worse. The Assyrian army is creeping into his territory, and they're setting up camps all around the perimeter. What made it even worse was the, the rulers of the northern kingdom and of Syria who wanted to fight this rebellion, they were angry with Ahaz because he didn't join their, their coalition. So now they were setting up camp to attack him, thinking that if they bullied him enough, he would finally succumb and, and join in with them. So now we pick up in our story for today, and Ahaz is hiding out. He's in... Uh, this sister, he's in this underground water chamber by himself, trying to figure out what the heck he's going to do. He's taking hits from the left and from the right. The Assyrians and the Syrians and the Israelites, everybody is closing in on him and he's panicking and he doesn't know what to do. Well, so Isaiah comes to him and God realizes that Ahaz is important. That that southern kingdom is so important because if that falls, all of Israel is lost. And this Assyrian army, these, these pagans, these terrible people will come in and wipe out anything of the Jewish people. So Isaiah comes to Ahaz and God is begging Ahaz to remain faithful. Comes to him again, he keeps speaking, it says, as it starts. It's like God's thinking, as long as I keep talking, maybe he'll finally join in with me. Maybe he'll finally believe me. And God says, Ahaz, tell me what you need. I'll do any miracle you want. Anything to convince you that I'll be faithful to you. I will perform the greatest miracles on earth and heaven. I'll turn hell upside down. I'll make day into night. I'll make the moon into the sun. I'll do whatever you need to do to convince you that I am steadfast, that I am real, and that I can get you through this. That you don't need to cut your losses and, and form these political ties. Ahaz says to, to Isaiah, who's speaking on behalf of God, no, 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 you don't have to do any of that. Because I won't put God to the test. Now he says it like he's being this real faithful God. That no, I don't need any proof that God will provide for me. But Isaiah gets angry with him. And it's because he realizes that what Ahaz is doing is trying to give himself an escape plan. Because if God did these amazing signs, performed these amazing miracles before him, well then Ahaz can't argue with it. He's got to follow what God says. But if he doesn't have any real hard proof, if he doesn't have any amazing miracle that's standing right in front of him, well, then maybe he can always cut his losses further on down the road. And that is exactly what he does. If you follow along in the Bible, when you get to 2 Kings, you find out what happens at the end of this story. All of these invading armies are coming in on Ahaz's kingdom. They're all encroaching on his fortress, and he panics. He gets so scared that he's going to get killed. He's so scared of what will happen with his kingdom 
that he buckles and he doesn't trust God. And instead he decides to make an allegiance. But he's so petrified, he's so panicked that he doesn't even make the allegiance with the good guys who are trying to fight. He makes it with the Assyrians because he figures they're going to win in the end anyway. He shows a complete lack of faith, a complete lack of trust that God will actually see him through even the darkest time. And at the very end of the story, after Ahaz has signed an agreement with the Assyrians, after he's turned his back on all of the other uh, groups of God's people, Ahaz, who had been promised safety from the Assyrian king, who had been promised that he would still be able to be in power, walks into the Assyrian king's chamber, and he sees that the Assyrian king had destroyed the temple, taken the altar and melted it down, and made a new altar to a pagan god where he was sacrificing animals on it. And Ahaz finally realizes how much he had betrayed God and how much he had failed God. <laughs> and it wasn't that Ahaz was a bad god. It wasn't that Ahaz was trying to work against God. It's that Ahaz took a hit and he lost sight of his plan. He took a hit and he panicked. And he just tried to find some way to get out. You know, you switch a few thousand years later, you get to this story in our gospel of Joseph. Joseph, who is about to have a dream come true. Now, tradition says that Joseph was a little bit of an older God <coughs> for marrying age. So it had taken him a while to find someone to spend the rest of his life with. And finally, he finds the woman of his dream, this young, wonderful, beautiful woman, Mary, that he's going to spend the rest of his life with. He gets engaged to her, which back then is more than just going out to a nice dinner and putting a ring on someone's finger. It's filing with the, with the county clerk's office, with legal paperwork, that you're about to be married. And he can't wait to start his new life with her. And he finds out that she's pregnant. And he knows that he's not the father. Imagine the punch in the gut that that had to be for Joseph. Think about the pain that he had to find out that the woman that he loved was carrying a child that wasn't his. Think about how angry he probably was. How much he wanted to, to curse her out, call her out. To do what would have been acceptable in that time of dragging her out into the street, telling everyone how terrible she is, and having her stoned to death. That's what normally would have happened back then. But Joseph, in the midst of all that hurt, amidst all of that pain that he was feeling, decided instead to not act on those impulses, decided instead that he would be forgiven and kind. And he decided he was going to break off the engagement, but do it quietly at least, to protect Mary and protect her dignity. And that was enough of a crack, enough of a crack in the door for God to stick his foot in. God realized that Joseph was a righteous man, as it says in our scripture, that, that Joseph was a kind man. And so God comes to Joseph, just as he came to Ahaz. And God tries the exact same argument that he had with Ahaz. Hey, Joseph, I know that you doubt right now. I know that, that you're hurting right now. I know that you're afraid right now. But trust me, I'll get you through this. Trust me, I have a plan here. Trust me, you are an important part of this picture. Because Joseph is key to Jesus' birth. Just as if there's no Mary, there's no Jesus. If there's no Joseph, there still is no Jesus. Joseph is the, the line of David. 
Joseph is the royal line that has to be lended to Jesus to make him the Messiah. Without Joseph, it's all for naught. And it all falls apart. And so God is, is pleading with Joseph, hoping that Joseph will be faithful, just as he pled with Ahaz, hoping that he would be faithful. But as opposed to Ahaz, we see the difference that Joseph listens to God. Joseph holds to God's word. And Joseph follows God and raises Jesus as his son. And notice, as Joseph is, is living out that faithfulness, we get a different promise than we got with Ahaz. You know, all those Old Testament readings tell us that the Messiah will be born and it will be called Emmanuel, which means God is with us. A reminder that in our darkest time, that God is there to be by our side, to help us through. But when Jesus is born, He's named Jesus, not Emmanuel, God saves. God doesn't just stand next to us. God helps us in our time of trouble. God gets us through those difficult moments. That's the promise that's able to be lived out because of Joseph saying yes to God. It's appropriate, it's good to hear stories like this, especially at this time of the year. Because I guarantee that every single person in this room, at one time or another, has taken a punch to the gut. Maybe not literally, but figuratively, emotionally, mentally, at some point in your life. You felt a slap in the face, you felt a punch, you felt like you were being forced down onto the canvas. And in that moment, you probably were afraid probably didn't know how you could possibly get up and, and do anything else. You know, especially this time of the year, in the holidays, we feel lots of hits all the time between stress and pressure for the holiday, around finances, around health, around relationships in our family. We all take hits each and every day. We each get knocked down over and over again onto the canvas. And it becomes so hard to get ourselves up and, and to convince ourselves that, that God really does have a plan for us in all of this. I had a great conversation right before we started worship. Uh, someone who said to me, you know, I wish it was as easy as it was for Isaiah. You know, Isaiah and Joseph and, and these other people, they had these dreams, they had these dramatic things that God grabbed them and told them that they were special and that they had something special happening in their lives. I wish I had that clarity. I wish I had that. Well, hear it now. God has a plan for each and every one of you. God has an important, vital ministry that God is relying on you for. As much as God relied on Ahaz, as much as God relied on Joseph, as much as He relied on Mary and all of those other great people that have gone before us, God created you to do some amazing, special thing that only you can do in this world. You may not know what it is yet. And you may not know even until long after you've accomplished it. But God has made you for that purpose. And in those moments where you lose faith, in those moments where you take those hits that knock you down and you don't know how you're going to get up, God is pleading with you. God is begging you to get up and do that ministry that God needs you. God is reminding you that He will always be with you in the darkest moments, in the times of greatest <coughs> doubt and despair, that that love will never leave you. God's reminding you that it doesn't matter how many times you get knocked down to the canvas, it matters how many times you get up. And God just wants you to get up one more time when you get knocked down. We celebrate the birth of Christ 
on Christmas Day. But more than that, we realize that Christ is born anew each and every day in the ministries that each of you do <coughs> in your daily lives. I know we all take hits from time to time. But don't panic. Don't be afraid. Don't lose faith because God is with you and God saves through Jesus. Amen.